Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to start with worship, as we always do. So if you guys could stand, I'll pray to open the service. God, I thank you for this hour, hour and a half that we can take out of our week to come here and to worship you, to praise you, to get refilled and re-energized by you, to get encouraged by you, and to get encouraged by the people around us. I pray that that's what you'll do in each of our hearts today, that we'll be encouraged. Um, so I just lift, I lift our worship team, I lift this congregation up to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start with Praise is Rising.
do whatever is easiest, I guess. I want to put forward some work into being a member of this church. And so that's kind of why I decided to do it eventually. And I also want to be able to be part of the decisions. So <laughs> I got to do that. And yeah, so with that, I want to share a little bit of my story, testimony, I guess. I wouldn't say that I have a story where there's like a beginning to it so much. Like I've been, I've been pretty blessed by God to, I think from a very young age to always be pretty close to him. And I've never gone to a point in my life where I felt very far from him. I didn't really, never really needed to figure it out on my own, I guess. It always just made sense to me. And God kept me close in that way. And I think a large part of that is because of the blessing of my parents in my life. I think that the reason that, well, the way I am today, but also just the person I am is because of the blessing of who my parents have been. Even before my, even before I was born, like before my life, I think my life is a blessing from them. So that's been, uh, that's been kind of a realization over the past while that I am blessed to be part of their family. And so with that, I wanted to share a couple things, a couple points in my life where I have felt God closer or he has spoke to me. And I'd say one of the earliest that I can remember is when I was 12. I think I was 12. I don't remember the year exactly or age, but there was a moment I remember I was in my room and I was listening to music and I felt, I was 12 years old, and I think that's one of the moments I felt God the most realist, the most real, the most close, probably up until that point in my life. And so I came upstairs and I remember praying with dad and that was one distinct moment that I remember. And then just growing up, I think, you know, we've all had um, struggles and things that everybody has their own battles. And another moment that I felt really close to God is when I was at Bible school. It was maybe two months into it or so. I was in my room and I was praying as well, and I was just praying about some things, and I remember distinctly that moment. I've never felt another moment like that where I, f I feel like there were chains that were broken, and I kind of just released, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I kind of just released myself and gave up my old life, I felt like, just the chains of just, um, thought patterns, I guess, and just things like that were broken, and even to this day, I feel like I haven't, I've never had to struggle with those things nearly as, I haven't really had to struggle with them that much, so I think that was a huge blessing in my life, and through that time, God has continued to bless me, and then even up until this spring, when I was making decisions about my life that were just going to be big changes and stuff, I had to just give up give up what my expectation and my plan was like pretty much what I wanted what my life was going to look like by my standards I made choices and I think in that moment I've never felt God kind of just hold me in the truth of his way is better than my way and I really learned that this spring as well so there's been there's been points along the way where God has held me closer, and there's been points that I've had to fight for a little bit more, but I think God has always been pretty faithful to me, and it's been, it's been a good time. So I think that's, <laughs> that's kind of the amount of words I want to say. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, McGregor. Um, he didn't use the word, but you can hear that he's really, at some point, surrendered his will to God's will, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And that's where we have to get to, okay? I just want you to know that Josh has been baptized by immersion before he came here. What's that? I meant uh, McGregor, okay? <laughs> Old age sets in. 62 years of marriage, 62 years of uh, uh, age. <laughs> anyway, anyway, good to, to hear your testimony, jo uh, McGregor, and I just hope that we are going to stand with McGregor in the days ahead as a church, and I know that he will be with us, okay? So he has been baptized by immersion before he came here, and so 
Uh, if you would, we're just going to affirm him now. If you are in favor of McGregor being a member of this church, let's have an amen. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, McGregor, God bless you and welcome into this church family. Thank you. Hey, kids. When was the last time you did exactly what your parents told you to do? Like the dishes or cleaning your room or your homework? And you did it without whining, arguing, or throwing a fit? And you tried to do a really good job? Well, today we're going to learn about a guy named Noah who did exactly what God asked him to do. So let's look at the story of Noah and see what God asked him to do. Everyone on earth got worse and worse. So God decided to send a flood. Do you remember the story of the brothers Cain and Abel? Where Cain got so jealous, he killed Abel? Well, Noah was born long after them. And since then, people acted worse and worse. But worst of all, they stopped loving God. God knew that the only way to make it so that there were good people on earth again was to send a flood that would wash away all the bad people. Noah was the only guy on earth who loved God. Noah loved God even though no one else wanted to. That must have been really lonely. It's almost like if you really loved basketball, but no one else did, so you had no one to play with. Lucky for Noah, God told him the big flood was coming, so he gave him some instructions so he could survive. Noah did exactly what God asked. The first time he asked. God told Noah to build a huge boat. He told him exactly how big it needed to be and exactly what to build it out of. And he told him to gather two of every animal, one boy and one girl. Then when the flood came, he told him to put all his animals and his family in the boat. And that was a lot of work for Noah, but he didn't whine or argue or throw a fit. He was careful about doing what God told him right when he told him. And then the flood came. It rained for 40 days, but Noah and his family were saved. God's big flood came and wiped out all the bad people. But Noah, his family, and all the animals were safe on the boat. If Noah hadn't listened to God, he would have been washed away by the rain. But because Noah listened, he was saved from the flood. Memory verse. So Noah did everything, exactly as God had commanded him. So kids, next time your parents ask you to do the dishes or clean your room, think of Noah. And remember, he didn't whine, complain, or throw a fit. He happily obeyed. I don't uh, know any way that we could have started this part of the worship service any better, McGregor, than to hear your testimony. There is nothing, nothing as important in this world as when you yield your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you had three posts that you drove down as markers when you're about 12 years old god began to deal with you got your attention you heard him you you, you were sensitive to him a couple of months or so into bible college god took you to another level and then just this last spring was it not you and god had time to begin to talk about and uh, one of the beautiful things that's obvious that you didn't do all the talking you did a lot of listening. And I want to tell you, folks, you learn a lot more from God of what he wants to say to you when you listen. You didn't use some cookie-cutter testimony that we hear a lot of times now. I didn't know when you were going to get to where you were going to get to, but uh, that's because you did it in the way God told you to do it. Good testimony. And Kurt, uh, where are you back there? Man, I, I, I thank you. I think since I was here last time, you guys have decided and moved forward with uh, some membership training. And uh, I think that is absolutely marvelous. When you join a church, you need to have a pretty good idea of what you're joining. 
Otherwise, you get down the road a little ways, they start throwing stuff at you, and you say, well, whoa, I didn't buy into that. Well, I'll tell you, from going forward from this day, what this church comes up with, McGregor, you're, you're in there too, buddy. So you're helping give input. Keep listening to what God's saying, and then you tell people what you're hearing God say. So thank you for that. Mom and Dad, great compliments to you. Great compliments to you. Uh, whew. Lisa, you stole my thunder. No, I was going to recognize Jerry and Rose, too. That's all right. I'm glad you thank enough of Mom and Dad to mention them. But, uh, you know, I come from a different perspective, uh, Jerry's little brother. And uh, I wasn't very old in 1959 when I noticed Jerry. <laughs> Jerry sort of found something he'd been looking for, and uh, he wasn't real good at hiding it. And... Uh, it didn't take very long to realize, uh, Rose, that, that you were a keeper. Yeah, Jerry had been fishing, but he found a keeper. And uh, thank you for saying yes. My wife says, back, you remember uh, several years ago when they had the, what they call the ERA movement? Uh, the equal women's rights thing? And boy, the women were on a kick and they were on a roll. Well, my wife said, Every woman in the world should be married to a hail for six months, and they'll get off of that kick. They'll go back to being wanting somebody that, that's, uh, you know, a dashing uh, kind of a person that respects the lady and opens the door and treats her like a, a lady. So, uh, Rose, all I can say is from, from a brother's perspective, boy, you're to be commended. You're a tough woman. 62 years. <laughs> Lawrence, I, uh, I don't know what to say to you other than, than you're a place, you, you chose to come back today to the place where you know you're loved and where for many years you and Florence sat there together. I will say a little bit of this to you, but I'll say it to you now in the presence of these people. You know, we often hear people state vows. I have no idea how many marriages I've done. And the preacher asks the question, you know, will you this and do you this and will and do. And people would respond by, you know, I will and, and I do. And when you and Florence uh, stated those vows in that little church there in Camrose, and you said, uh, I will. I think Tuesday afternoon, I'll not ask you to, but you could very honestly stand up and face the group that will be there and simply say, I did. You're not saying I will anymore. You did. We observed you the last few years as God was allowing Florence to gradually fulfill Scripture that says our body begins to wear out and to decay. And you showed us all how you're supposed to fulfill those vows. You kept Florence on your arm and by your hand until you could physically, literally no, do it no longer. So on behalf of your church family, we pay tribute today to Lawrence Smithson. God bless you. Rhonda, I haven't seen you since you were a little girl. I just remember one of the stories you told about Grant when they uh, had sort of the, the wedding renewal here after he came back. And Rhonda told a story that when Grant was small, she was small, he, he convinced her uh, that nickels were worth more than dimes because they were bigger than the dime. Was that not the way it was, Rhonda? So just bear that in mind. If you see some of your kids negotiating with those younger, make sure you know what they're negotiating. But it didn't hurt Rhonda. She's done all right. And is it Eileen? Is that the sister that's here behind all these masks and stuff? And I had my mask here till I got here with you. I, I just had to share my heart with you. And thank you for being here, guys. Let's pray. God, you... You have blessed us by giving us an opportunity 
to come into this place. Oh, Lord, have we been in a war between our nation, our province, our local areas, churches, families, even couples, friends. Well, Lord God, we've got a group of people in this room today that's here for one reason, one reason only. They want to give honor and praise to you, and they want you to speak to their heart for another week. God, lead us and guide us. Our answer is going to be yes to you. And thank you for your presence and your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. I shared this message, uh, the basis of it, with you a few years ago. But it seems to me like the longer and the further we go in this uh, COVID emphasis and COVID panic, the, the more confused I'm becoming. And so I'm not talking about where you are particularly, but I'm talking about I have really gotten confused on where we are and what's going on. And now the latest move that I heard this week that really concerns me is the, the people of Ontario are really putting the pressure on their premier that you would not even be able to attend a public church service if you had not been double vaxxed. And so we, we're continuing to move to another level, another level, another level. But I am praising God that those of you who, who are and those who aren't and those who may be and those who won't be and those who are, you're sitting together in the presence of God worshiping. The enemy, the devil, would do everything he can to split up a church, to split up homes. And so today I want to preach a message. I've got about, looks like approximately 17 minutes to deliver a one-hour message. So I'm going to give it a good shot. And uh, if you're taking some kind of medicine that you need uh, to do it on the clock, you step out and take it and then just come on back in and, and uh, you'll not miss a beat. So... Living a Christian life in this mixed up, messed up world. You know, it's pretty easy to live the Christian life as long as you're among the church family. As long as you're in circles where there's no pressure, no challenge. I told you before my illustration when I went down in the mine in Saskatchewan into a potash mine. Remember? 3,500 feet straight down into the earth. I had a little flashlight that they had given and and I remember shining it on the wall out of that wire cage while it was dropping down through the earth. And we got down at the bottom and they opened that thing. And, and I got out and we walked around over to it looked like a bunch of these little mash, uh, half-track looking trucks or whatever you call them. We climbed in there and I sat right behind the driver and he took off. And they had lots of fresh air, uh, about 1,500 kilometers of, of tunnels down underneath there at that time. And now they're telling me that it's up even lots more. And so as we drove around breathing this fresh air and such like, and I finally said to the driver, uh, would it be, and Ken Poneth was with me, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we went on this tour, and uh, I said to the driver, would you mind to take us where they're doing active mining? I'd like to see what it's like to be mining under there with some of these big equipment. They had their own tire repair place. They had their own uh, welding prefab place down in there, a repair shop. And uh, as we were driving, uh, we got out of the area where all the lights were on. And so I thumped on the driver and I said, would you mind to stop this little truck, turn it off, and turn the lights off? And I want to tell you, it was black like you can't imagine black. So I took my little flashlight, turned it on, shined it over his head and over the hood and down, the, down that tunnel. You cannot believe how much darkness that one little light would dispel. I meant to bring my flashlight today and turn it on in here and show you it, it doesn't have a lot of impact, right? One little light and add it with all these others. But you turn every light off on in here, turn it off, and turn that little light on, and then you'll see what it is. I want to tell you, we've never lived in an era in our lifetime where your light will do more in dispelling darkness than right now because we're living basically in a spiritually dark world. And uh, when you'll turn your light on and live for the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find that you're making a tremendous difference now. Living the Christian life is mixed up, messed up world. Number one, I'm going to walk through ten very quick points, so you'll have to hang on. The first one, and thank you, uh, McGregor, for the songs you chose. Uh, one of them that you chose, Seek Ye First, goes uh, directly with this first point. 
Uh, if we're going to be survivors in the midst of the world we're living in now, we're going to be the kind of people who will be seeking first the kingdom of God. Two things are involved there. First, in the sense that chronologically it's number one. If you ever lose focus of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom as the number one chronological thing in your life, you're going to begin to slip and to begin to slide. Uh, most of you have tried it before. I used to do it with youth when you have a, a campfire and you could take a stick and, and pick out one of the reddest, hottest coals in the edge of it and just drag it off over here to the side and keep talking and watch that. It'll go from a sparkle to a darkness to where you can eventually pick it up and handle it. Now you just stop seeking the kingdom of God and not being a chronological first in your life. And it won't be long till the devil can just about pick you up and handle you because you cooled off so bad there's no heat left to you. But also what you took that little coal and you shoved it back in the edge of the fire and you watched that particular coal. It wouldn't be very long till the red will start coming back and that little sparkle, those little white sparkles that come off of it, it'll come alive again. That's where we are today. We're going to have to fight hard to make sure we seek first. Also seek first means... It's, it's the most important. It's the, the most important thing. There's nothing else like seeking and living the kingdom of God. And there are lots of people today that are more open to hear about Jesus Christ and about the kingdom of God than at any point because they even are beginning to realize we don't have any answers. We don't know what to do. And then when you begin to talk about Jesus Christ, what he's already done, it's a powerful moment in their life. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says, and, and sound guys, I'm probably going to drive you nuts because we're going to move through here quick. We need to trust the Lord completely. Uh, where you trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. We can totally depend upon the, and trust the Lord because, number one, we can trust that our Lord Jesus is truth. Have you, have you got to the place where right now you struggle to know what is the truth about COVID? What is the truth about the value of a mask? What is the truth about the, the vaccine or not? What, what is the truth? If we could get the truth, every one of us could make a quick decision, could we not? But when you can't get the truth and you're having to sift through all of this stuff, I wish I had a little sifter. My granny used to have one. You poured flour in there and you squeezed this little thing and all the good stuff would go on out the bottom and when you got finished, you'd have all the junk up here. We need some way by the help of God to be able to sift through all the information that's coming at us because in the bottom of it, Jesus Christ is truth. We, need to, we can trust the Lord's character. God loves people. God's not trying to be mean to people. And even if this, some people ask me, well, D.K., do you believe that God caused this or God allowed it to happen? What? I, said, I don't know that, but I know one thing. It didn't happen, any of it, without God giving the green light. So I'm not sure what he's trying to teach us, what he's trying to say to us. But I do believe this is under the control and the hand of God because God's character is for our best for now and for eternity. You know, uh, some people got this thing moving right now. Uh, you should not spank your children at all because you're going to warp their creative juices and, and all of those kind of things. That's probably what's wrong with Jerry and me because uh, we got ours warped several times. Jack, Jerry didn't get near as many as he should have, but, but we got a lot of them. <laughs> but I think, I look back on it, I think, you know, that wasn't because my dad was being mean. It was because uh, he loved us. I knew after I got old enough to have to discipline my children, I did what he probably did too. Sometime after you have to punish your child and it looks like you're being mean, after you're finished, you have to go off by yourself and you have to cry and say, I didn't enjoy that. You know, I don't think God's enjoying what's happening to his people right now. Man, we think we've got it bad. What about the people in, in Haiti? What about the people in Afghanistan? What about the people in Venezuela right now? What about the people all over the world called Christian? Uh, you can have one thing happen to someone who worships Allah, and the whole world goes into a turmoil. And you can destroy literally hundreds of thousands of Christians, and it barely won't even make the news. Something's wrong. God's character can be trusted. We can trust God's ability because he's able. We can trust his strength 
because he's omnipotent. We can trust the Lord Jesus for his redeeming mercy and grace. And we also must then seek and obey the Lord. Peter says in Acts 5.29, But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Uh, that has become a really tough situation in our era. When does what the government's saying and what people are saying, when does that stop being what we do and God takes precedence? I don't have some clear-cut answer for you. I believe there's a time that even though it's hard and rugged and mean and unfair, we're still supposed to listen to the government. He says there, I'll put them in there, Romans 13. But I think there will come some times, we may have already come through some of it, but when they begin to tell us that we cannot worship, I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think I will be avoid, avoiding worship. I may have to go underground to do it. But you know, it's just like when I walk in this room, nobody here except God and me knows what's on my brain when I look at you. And I think when we begin to, to be told you can't worship, you may not be able to get publicly, but some of the fastest growing churches right now in the world are in China, and they're telling us that in Afghanistan the Christians are growing rapidly because we seek and we desire to obey the Lord. I think I've told you before how our society has told God to get out of the family we're told to get uh, out of the man and wife marriage. We're told to get out of our schools, our judicial system, get out of government. How many of you, by the way, uh, in the last election we had, how many of you actually heard some of the candidates uh, really promoting as one of their platform their faith in Jesus Christ? I mean, really taking a stand and really beating the drum about it. You know why? Because if you get up and you pronounce... The fact that I'm a Christian and I'm following Jesus Christ, you just wiped your name off of the ballot. But how can we expect people to seek and obey God if they don't even believe He exists? When people don't even believe there is a God, how can you expect Him? So don't get panicky when the government goes a different direction. You hang on to your faith, you hang on to your relationships, you hang on to your trust. In God. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says, We must live having godly courage. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. McGregor, the commitment that you've made, uh, experience would say, the more commitment you make to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people will tell you, oh boy, it's going to get easier and easier for you. Let me tell you, that's a lie. The more you commit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the closer you walk to Him, the tougher it's going to get for you. How do I know that? Who was the one who never sinned? What happened to Him? He ended up on a cross. He who knew no sin, according to Corinthians, He who knew no sin became sin for us and died on a cross. So don't think that our faith in Him is going to make it get easier and better. Don't ever teach your kids that because you're, it's kind of like today. They need truth. Truth is, it's hard to live the Christian life in this mixed up, messed up world that we're in right now. But it can be done when you trust the Lord, when you seek Him, when you follow Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Godly courage takes away the fear. I like your song this morning. I'm no longer a slave to fear. And the reason that happens when he says here, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind. Godly courage means you know that God is with you all the time. Godly courage comes because we know that he will not leave us nor forsake us. Godly courage comes because it means that we can live in peace, with joy, and with hope, even in this mixed up, messed up world that we're in now. Godly courage is what keeps us moving. Hope is not like wishful thinking. Hope is like a guaranteed this is the way it's going to happen. God is going to be in charge now. God will be in charge tomorrow. 
And when everything else collapses and blows up, bombs, whatever, God will be in charge. He still reigns. Uh, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. We, his people, we, his people, we, his people, must seek to meet God's requirements. I get pretty nervous when I hear preachers today that emphasize grace so much that it borderlines on saying you have zero accountability and zero responsibility. Ever how you live, God's going to treat us all the same. I don't believe for one minute that's the truth. I believe God has agape, unconditional love. Yes. I don't believe I'm going to change God. I'm going to ever change His love for me. But to tell people it doesn't matter at all what you believe or how you believe it and how you live, that's just not accurate. Because we've got the scriptures here that are causing us to believe this. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it possible to say, well, I work pretty hard at two of those, but that other one, I'm kind of out of there. Now, this is hard for you to believe, but trust me, I'm telling you the absolute truth. Uh, until I passed to 18 years old, I was one more skinny dude. I mean, that's a fact, wasn't it, Jerry? That's where I got my nickname, Superman. You know, my brothers, Betty still calls me soup. You know, I love her dearly, but she still calls me soup because it came back from when I was so skinny. When I was a little kid about, oh, I don't know, this, this person's age right here maybe, and I remember crossing sort of a rocky, swift water stream, and I could not cross that until my dad got a hold of my hand. And then, man, we could just walk right across there. I want to tell you, that's where we're at today. You better seek to walk humbly with your God. He's the only one that can get you from point A to point B. And that is, you let him hold your hand. There's two different kinds of religion. There's monkey religion and there's cat religion. Uh, too many people have monkey religion, which means when a mom gets ready to move the family, the little one grabs on to the mama and she hang, they have to hang on like crazy. If they can't, they fall off. I like cat religion. You ever watch a cat move all of her kittens? She'll grab them right by the scruff of the neck. And she carries them. Their getting from point A to B was dependent on mama, not the kitten. You getting from point A to, day, a to B today in this world that we're living right now is not based on your ability to hang on to God. It's God's ability to hold on to us, to walk humbly with your God. You know, to walk humbly means... God, I thank you. Man, I am sheltered from the storm. I can cross this little river right now. And we're in a storm. We're in some deep water. Walk out deeper. Get a little bit further with the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 37, verse 8. We must not fret and we must not worry. Psalm 37, verse 8 says, Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only comes to harm. It's pretty easy for God's people today to fret. And just get nervous about this whole thing. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Philippians 4.6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Lawrence, I say to you, just as an encouragement that you already know, you're going to make it okay. It's going to be hard. It's going to be lonely. You're going to have emotional waves come over you like a tsunami. But because you're walking with the Lord your God, you're going to be all right. He's going to see you through. And the good thing is that someday you'll get to be together again. Uh, he'll, we're not wanting that to happen right away. My dad used to say, oh, I'm ready to go, but we're not trying to get up a load tonight. So God has taken Florence, and we're on our way. We live in a time where many, many people are giving up. Even a Christian can be tempted to give up in today's world. But I would say to you, don't give up physically, don't give up emotionally, and don't give up spiritually. The devil is not in control. God is. So we're not going to give up. We're not going to give up emotionally, though sometimes, boy, it just gets hard. Everywhere you look, it just looks bleak and gloomy. But don't give up. 
Don't give up. Psalm 145, verse 7, I love this one. We must celebrate often. If you're going to make it through right now, you need to celebrate often. I believe that one of our major mistakes that we're making as individuals, as Christians, as families, and yes, even as churches, we don't celebrate enough. Now, we're, we're quick to observe all the problems and the pains and the heartaches and where we disagree. My lens figure out something to celebrate together. If you can't do it, call Brenda. She'll do something and send you some wiener money and hot dog money. Celebrate together. When you can get together again, I mean. But celebrate. Just cast off the gloom and enjoy each other. Because you know what? The best friends you've got in the world right now is your Christian family and your Christian friends. Because they're feeling the same thing you're feeling. They feel like you feel. They're, they're challenged like you're challenged. And don't think that you've lost your salvation because you feel challenged some days to just almost give up. I shared with this little group as we prayed today, one of the hardest things about my ministry role in my work, and by the way, thank you, Cornerstone, for the $6,000 that you sent to Midwest Baptist Association just recently to help in missions work across Alberta, the Northwest Territories, and the Yukon Territory. Thank you for doing that. Even though you're having hard times, even though you're balanced, your budget, you're having a hard time getting it to balance, and you're just having to do that sometimes like an old friend we had at Worsley. He said, don't try to make the ends meet. Just grab the middle and let the ends flop. And so that's what you're doing. You're just by faith, you're grabbing the middle and not even trying to make all the ends meet. We celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness and again, I believe one of the things that we're making a mistake is we don't celebrate enough. We need to find lots of things to celebrate. The last one is this. We must be holy and seek to live holy. In Leviticus 19, 1 and 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, we will never be like Jesus Christ. We'll never be perfect. But if we don't at least have a desire to strive to be like him, to be holy, to learn how to say no to some stuff, we're going to have a hard time getting through this mixed up, messed up world. Our faith in Jesus Christ makes us a Christian because of his mercy and grace. Now, hear what I'm trying to say. It is the, our faith in Jesus Christ. He's the one. That makes me a Christian. But now, through the help of the Holy Spirit, we have to seek to be like Him and to live like Him in today's world. He's done His part. Jesus died on a cross, offered every one of us who will come to Him by faith. He offers to us forgiveness of sin. He offers to us eternal life. He offers to us the opportunity to be called Christian. He offers to us the opportunity to serve Him in the midst of this difficult world. But now, we also need to be seeking to be holy. Seek to be living like Jesus Christ. One of the biggest disclaimers, I think, for us today, perhaps is our failure in keeping John 13, 35, which says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Could I ask this question? How's Cornerstone done? with this particular verse in the last 19 months. I'm not talking about out there in the world, you know, loving all the lost world, loving everybody out there. I'm talking about loving within the family called Cornerstone Baptist Church. How well have you done? How well have I done? Some people can make it really hard to love them. Brenda would say, I'm shocked she didn't say Amen. Because there are some days, I don't know why she would think it, but there are some days I'm probably not real lovable. But by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, Cornerstone Baptist Church, because you love one another. McGregor, help us lift that to a new level. We don't have to agree on everything. We have to agree that Jesus is Lord. 
We have to agree that he died for our sins. We have to agree that we have to confess him. We need to agree on becoming a part of a church, following him, baptism, following him, whatever he calls us to. But you don't have to agree on the mask. You don't have to agree on all this other stuff. But you can't let it cause you to disagree to where you don't love each other. You know, Brenda's wrong on some stuff, but I love her anyway. No, what a joke, huh? Brenda, let's move on because I want to have lunch with you. Do you remember before uh, GPS, those of you who had any kind of an agricultural background, I've always been uh, the kind of guy, you know, farming or anything, I've always been the kind of guy that set a goal out there that I was striving toward. And I remember when we were farming, you couldn't do that on Lawrence's land. <laughs> Lord was kind of like, he, his place was kind of like they talked about Saskatchewan, southern Saskatchewan. Only place you in the country you could stand on your front yard, front deck, watch your dog leave home for three days. Lawrence could have a deer go across the other end of his field, and he couldn't even see the end of the field. Just so flat and so level, so everything out there. But, uh, but I had lots of them that were little fields. And I'd pick a tree or pick something out there when I'd start to make my first ferrule. If it was a plow, a cultivator, a disc, a swather, a combine, and I would set my eye on that goal, and I tried my best to make a straight line. Boy, Brenda and I, we talk about it often when we're traveling now. That GPS just makes you feel so small, doesn't it? It made me wonder why I made so many bobbles when I was trying to do that. Because usually I set the GPS, and every one is perfect distance, straight rows. Guys, pick your goal and let it be Jesus Christ to be holy and to live holy lives. If you make a bobble, it's not good enough to just say, throw it out. You get back on course, and you go again. As the team comes to lead us in prayer, in worship, let me pray. Father, we bow before you right now. Oh, what a, what a mighty God you are. And Lord, I thank you that even in the midst of this messed up, messed up, mixed up world we're in, Lord God, how you speak to our soul. You speak to our mind. Our spirit finds strength and courage in you. Lord, there are those today, maybe even in this room, that are right on the edge that God is just almost more than it can bear. I pray that your spirit will rush winds of freshness, winds of encouragement. Lord, for those in this room that, that may need to do exactly what McGregor has done, they need to just say yes to you. Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. God, would you give that today if it's to repent, ask you to forgive, come into their life? Would you do that? Maybe others who have never yet been baptized, maybe this would be their day to say yes. Maybe you've got a call on their life. You may call out of this group. Those are going to teach. Those will be elders. You may even call a pastor from within this group. God, we're saying yes. We're open to you. Thank you for this time of worship today. Again, Lord, we ask that you would walk with Larch and his family. May we see the Lord Jesus Christ in a fresh way today. In your name we pray. Amen.